welcome to Passion for Jesus with Mike Bickle. Today, we will be going through the series, The Bride of Christ, Growing in Intimacy with God. In this series, biblical truths, insight, and practical application invite us into encountering the bridegroom God and understanding our identity as the bride of Christ. You can download the notes for today's session at mikebickle.org. Before we begin the message, join us for a time of worship. Well, let's uh, do a quick review from last week. Human history is moving to the grandest corporate moment of all of human history. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding of the Lamb of God. But it isn't only that he's getting married, but he's getting married to a prepared bride. It worked. The people said yes. The Spirit moved, and the Father was right. He planned it, and it comes to fullness. Well, he's returning for a prepared bride, and that's the urgency that I feel because we're getting closer and closer to that day. That means the Holy Spirit's going to be really locking into this subject in a greater way. Paragraph B. Remember the uh, final prayer in the Word of God. And it's the final prophecy in the Word of God as well. We looked at it last week. We broke it down phrase by phrase. That the Spirit and the Bride are crying, come. That's the final prayer culminating the testimony of the Word of God for prayer and worship. There it is. It will be a bridal cry. And it's the final prophecy. We're, we're seeing the Spirit says, I'm going to do this in the church. We looked at it last week. It's an upward cry to Jesus. But it's not only a cry, come Lord Jesus, in intimacy, come near us. It's a cry, come to us in revival. And then ultimately, it's a cry, come for us in the skies. But it's a vertical cry. But we looked at it last week. It's also a horizontal cry. We're calling to people to come. Come to the bridegroom God. It's more than come for forgiveness. Yes, we always want forgiveness. But come to a man who is a bridegroom king who forgives. And so you'll see as you, as you read it carefully, the cry is come and people are responding according to their thirst. 
Paragraph C, the other point I want to draw on from last week, and I don't think we can emphasize this point too much, is that Paul talked about Ephesians 5. This is one of the grand passages, prophecies for the church. If you love the church and you love the victorious church, which you do, of course, Ephesians 5, this is one of the primary places in the whole of the Word of God where it says it's crystal clear that Verse 26, Jesus is going to cleanse the church and he's going to wash her defilement, her unbelief, her dullness. He's going to wash it off of her heart, but he's going to wash it by the word, by the spoken word, by the word that is sang, by the word of testimony one to another, by the written word reading it. By giving us the word in dreams and visions, he's at night, he's gonna take his word, wash defilement, heaviness, fear, boredom, dullness, confusion, unbelief. He's gonna wash it. He's not just gonna wave his hand and our heart is vibrant, but he's gonna do it through the word. Again, through singing it, speaking it, writing it, reading it, all these different ways, dreaming it. And the net result is, it's a glorious church, or I like to use the word victorious, a church walking in the glory of God, and this is before he returns. He's not talking about people in the resurrection with resurrected bodies walking pure. That, that's, that's given. This is a great work of the Spirit in the generation the Lord returns. But he goes on, he goes, and you know the passage, he says, like a husband loves his wife, he goes, the man, he goes, no man, verse 29, ever hated his own flesh, but he cherishes. He nourishes and cherishes. And then Paul stops and says, that's obvious that a man nourishes and cherishes himself. But he goes, let me make a dynamic point. Jesus cherishes the church this way. The point I want to make is that when he washes us with the word, I mean, the, the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, is valuable. But, but the particular part of the word is the word that communicates his cherishing heart towards us. Now, we want the whole word of God, but the washing of defilement and boredom and sin and compromise, what washes us is the word of God that unveils this cherishing nature of Jesus. Now, there's many, many passages and many facets of it, and I'm going to give you a few, of them to, a few of them tonight. When we see the bridegroom cherishing us, and we feel cherished, beloved, we can walk in obedience, and we can refuse sin, compromise, fear of man, anxiety, all kinds of things if we feel cherished. But I have found over the years that Many in the church, they never study out what the scripture says about his heart cherishing his, his bride. So I, I've talked to people over the years, they go, wow, I just never really got into that. You know, I was more into our task, what we were supposed to do, which is good. I, I believe in that, you know, teaching people skills, ministry skills, leadership skills, all, those are great. Very, very important, and they're part of the word. But a lot of folks have been raised in a spiritual environment where they never focused, locked into the cherishing heart, the emotions of God. I want you to, to, to walk away tonight with the, the word that washes me from sin, compromise, dullness, boredom, is the word about him cherishing me. And there's many facets to that diamond, many, many, many facets. And so not only do you want that for yourself, but as people that are wanting to disciple others or teach others or train others, you want to lock into this, this vein of truth in the Word of God. It's so fantastic. Okay, Roman number two. What is the bridal message? What is the bridegroom message? You can say it either way. I, I, again, I, I like the term the bridegroom message because we're only a bride because he's a bridegroom. So he's the centerpiece of it. If somebody asked me to say it in one sentence, I'd go, ugh, that, that, you know, that's, that's pushing me. But here, here's my sentence. Paragraph A, the bridegroom message is the call. There's, I got four little facets. It's a call to intimacy with God, 
by encountering his heart, that's the cherishing thing I was talking about, studying out what his heart is like by encountering his heart, but it isn't just encountering his heart and walking in partnership. He doesn't just want us to feel loved. He wants us to walk hand in hand with him, so to speak. He wants to walk in deep partnership. It's about partnership, but he doesn't just want us working for him. He wants us working with him. But he wants us doing it in a spirit of abandonment, meaning not just, okay, Jesus, you know, I'm gonna have a little devotion time and I'm gonna go do my thing. He goes, no, I want you abandoned to me. I want you to love me with all of your heart because only for this reason, I love you with all of my heart. There's a mutual abandonment that's at the core of the bridegroom message. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine forever, is what he's saying. I want all of you and I've given all of me. So the bridegroom message, some people have, have really misapplied this message and they think, Bridegroom God, that means he's nice. It's true. Bridegroom God, he's tender. Okay, cool. And they've taken the message of the kind and tender heart of God, and they thought, if he's that nice and that tender, I can be lazy, and I can be careless in my obedience. I can do a little compromise here and there. He's nice. And the bridegroom message isn't supposed to produce you know, like, well, you're so nice, I'll just kind of chill and not really pay that much attention to my walk with you. And if I compromise a little bit, you're so nice, hey, you're a bridegroom. That's a misapplication. And I've seen that misapplication many times. I go, no, you're missing it. The bridegroom message is a spirit of abandonment. He's not saying I stamped your passport to get you out of hell, to go to heaven. I mean, he does get us out of hell and to heaven. He goes, no, I want you with me forever in total partnership. I'm all in, and I want you all in. That's the bridegroom message. It's a spirit of abandonment. What's mine is yours, the Lord says, and what's yours is mine all the way to the end, together forever. So that's how I would say the, the bridegroom message in one sentence. It's a call to intimacy, encountering his emotions, his heart, Walking in partnership, not working for him, but together with him, dialoguing with him, but with a spirit of abandonment, that exclusive love, this exclusivity where I'm fully yours. That is core to the bridegroom message and the end time church being prepared. Well, I'm gonna say this, this whole sentence and kind of say it with a little few different words. So here's the, the uh, next sentence here. Just take a look at this. The Holy Spirit is gonna to reveal to us the deep things of his heart. Now, this verse in 1 Corinthians 2 is so extravagant. Look, look at 1 Corinthians 2. The Spirit searches everything in created order, including the deep things of God. He searches everything. I mean, the Holy Spirit is God. But what this is saying is the Spirit discerns the deepest things of the heart of the Father and the Son. I mean, how extravagant, the deep things. I mean, even to say God and deep things of God is like, well, that's so out of our reach. And it goes on to say, the Spirit, he's been given to us so he can share these things with us. Beloved, this is extravagance beyond anything I can imagine. So as I talk about encountering his heart, I'm talking about his emotions, his affections, which is really the same thing as emotions. Or affections is, is one dimension of emotions, but it's a very important part of his emotions. The Holy Spirit wants to reveal his beauty. Jesus wants to, he doesn't want us in a bored relationship now or forever. He says, it's not a boring relationship. I am gonna absolutely exhilarate your heart forever because I'm a bridegroom, and this is not gonna be a, a boring marriage covenant relationship. You are going to be always leaning into something new and being filled with wonder if you will really lean into the relationship. It's gonna tell us his secrets. He's gonna, the Holy Spirit reveals his commitments. And then the Holy Spirit empowers us to a wholehearted partnership. Wholehearted love partnership. So I'm really saying the 
What is the bridegroom message? I kind of restated it again. Now, God created you. He created the human design to be the bride of Christ. Now, millions and billions have said no, but they were created that way. They were created in the image of God to be the father's children and to be the bridegroom's eternal companion. We were built, we were designed to long for intimacy, full exposure, but having no shame in it. We were built to long for that. And the reason that matters is because it's who you are. And to try to live the Christian life, which many do, and I'm not getting down on them, but they try to live the Christian life kind of half in and like, hey, Love you, Jesus. Blow you a kiss on the way. Beloved, you were created for intimate encounter. You were created to be known and to feel no shame in being known in all your weakness, but to actually have confidence because you know the one who knows you. And so the, the idea of kind of moving fast along in the kingdom and not taking time for this, it's, it's going against our entire creative design. We can't function without settling down and saying this is our future in this age but forever. I was created for intimacy. My heart won't be alive. My heart won't be restored. My heart won't be functioning right if I'm not pursuing this. Simply, I was made in the image of God to connect with God this way. And so I look at a lot of believers and they love Jesus and they're all busy and I go, oh, it's not like he's mad at you, but you're missing the biggest opportunity. He's really here and the spirit has deep things to bring you into and you were created for them. Well, let's look just a little bit. Paragraph B, we're gonna just elaborate his emotions. Holy Spirit's gonna reveal the son's emotions, the bridegroom's emotions. Now, when I talk about his heart, his emotions are more than affections, but his affections are a very exciting part of him, that he's not just a God that has power, but he has deep affections, he has deep desire. And again, some folks, say that this is new to them. I mean, they kind of technically think God has desire, but they don't think much about it. You know why you have desires? Because you're made in his image. God doesn't have desires because you do. You have them because he does. You have affections and you have gladness because he does. We're made in his image. Well, paragraph one, affections, and we could go on and on on this subject. But Jesus feels the intensity of love, the affections for us the Father does for him. John 15, 9, those of you that have been around here for a few years. This is probably the verse I quote more than any other verse in the Bible, John 15. I can't get over it. I've been quoting this verse for 25 years. I just can't get over it. Jesus loves me like the Father loves him? Am I? Why? <laughs> why am I that interesting to you? This blows my mind. I mean, I know why the Father loves the Son with intensity. The Son is so worthy and so interesting. But I look at this and I go, really? What? I wouldn't love me that much if I was you. And the answer is, yeah, but you don't know who I am. This is who I am. It's the only way I love with all of my heart. I, I can't love different than who I am. Well, Paul, <clears throat> he mentions this in Ephesians 3. And we looked at this a little bit last week. Such a big passage, I'm just gonna barely mention it. He says in verse 18 that we wanna comprehend. He says the width, the length, the depth, the height, all these four dimensions, and those are big words, and we'll look at these at one of our sessions. We wanna experience, because to know is to experience his affections. Why? Because that's what, that's the pathway to entering to the fullness of God's purpose for your life. You will only reach the fullness of what God has ordained for whatever season of life you're in, because there's a fullness for this season. It's not the fullness, you know, in the absolute sense, but 
You'll only enter into the fullness of what God has for you in any season as you're growing in the revelation of his affections for you. It, it, Paul puts it together. He says, not only does the affections, Jesus cherishing us, wash us, that's Ephesians 5, here in Ephesians 3, he goes, the affections, that's our escort forward into the fullness of whatever the purpose of God is for you in whatever season. Now, I'm only entering into a fraction of my eternal purpose and fullness, but I want to enter into all that I'm supposed to enter into in this season of my life. And Paul says, know this, you won't enter into the fullness of that, Ephesians 3, 19, without hand in hand growing in the understanding of affections. Well, number one, he has affections, and there's giant subject. Number two, he has gladness. And the idea that I, I want you to give you here in the next point or two, the big picture idea I want you to see, is that Jesus has this very dynamic, generous, happy personality. He has a dynamic, generous, happy personality. A joyful, I, I don't mean silly, giddy joyful, but a profound sense of joy when he relates to you. And we have this idea, many do through, the, through church history, that God is mostly mad or mostly sad when he relates to us. Like he's mad, like, Bickle, I said stop it. You keep doing it. I'm going to forgive you again. But, you know, that's the tone they think he talks. He's mad or, not mad, but he's sad. Oh, my God. Poor little, weak, little, pathetic Mike. I love you. Oh, I'm going to forgive you again. Oh, you break my heart every day. <laughs> no, no, a lot of people, that, that's their view of what humility is. They can live under kind of the weight of God mad at them or in this vortex that he's going, <sighs> then they think, okay, okay, if I live there, that's humility. No, that means you don't understand who you're talking to. He is... He's not, he's not uh, casual and just flippant about our weakness. And, and he's not saying, ah, oh, boys will be boys. Who cares? I'm God. Hey, I'm nice. No. He's just saying, no, my generosity is bigger than your weakness. And I see who you are 70 years on the earth, but I see who you are the next 70 billion years as well. I know the real you forever. And my generosity and my big understanding of you, I'm, I'm, I get what's going on, and I want to help, get, help you get out of it. And we don't want to take this revelation of God and be, you know, uh, you know, casual and like cavalier about, oh, I mean, he's nice, he'll forgive us. No, I want to every time say thank you, but I'm not going to get stuck in a identity of how weak I am. I'm not going to get stuck in this identity. It's like I, I used to ask the question, and, and I do sometimes, but I used to say it all the time, are, are you a, a sinner who struggles to love God, or are you a lover of God who still struggles with sin? And beloved, it's a big difference. I am a lover of God. That's who I am and what I do. That's what I'm about, but I still struggle with sin. But a lot of believers think they're they're slaves of sin that are struggling to love. It's a very different point of view. But I look at his generosity, and the, he's got this dynamic, positive, gracious personality. Psalm 16, uh, verse 11 says that the fullness of joy and pleasure is at his right hand. The epicenter of joy and pleasure in the created order comes out of his heart in his throne. Psalm 16, verse 11. That's not on the notes. But, but anyway, verse uh, number two, he's glad. Hebrews 9, 1, 9 says, he is an anointing of gladness beyond any other human being that ever lived. Nobody has the gladness in their human experience that Jesus did when he walked on the earth. And so we're dealing with the a man again, he's not flippant and giddy, but he's not overwhelmed with negativity and judgment and says, oh, it's you again. And we hear the voice of our authority figure in our life that's exasperated with us when we come before God. That's not the bridegroom God. 
It's, that's another, I mean, we're so used to that voice, whether it's a father, mother, coach, employer, boss, whatever. What, 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 whatever it is, that's the voice that we hear. But I tell you, he's anointed with gladness. He, he, it's, a, it's a happy marriage forever because of his personality. Then, number three, he delights. Psalm 62, top, top of page two. You know, I, I've told this many times, but it was in, back in November 1996 when I had this powerful prophetic dream one night and the audible voice of God in the dream. I was down at the One Thing Conference. Uh, this was years before we had the One Thing Conference, but I was down at the convention center in Kansas City. Thousands of young people, the audible voice of the Lord. I'm on the stage, sh shouts, call them Hephzibah. It's like thunder. And I thought, Hephzibah, what? And I'm, and I'm looking, the thunderous voice, I delight in them. I delight in them. Declare this. And, and the Lord spoke to me in the dream. He's going to change the emotional chemistry people. They're going to shift Many of them, I don't mean totally in one day, but radically in a day. They're going to get on a total new trajectory with God when this declaration comes over them. So every year, I always say it at least once. But it's more than a declaration. It's a paradigm. It's meaning a whole perspective. It's the bridegroom message. Beloved, he delights in the relationship. Not just when you're more mature than Paul the apostle. He actually delights in the relationship, he likes relating with us. Now, the, the real, one, one of the big reasons we struggle with this, we don't like ourselves, So we can't imagine God delighting in it. Thank you for watching. Next week, we will be continuing with the series, The Bride of Christ, Growing in Intimacy with God. For more resources from Mike Bickle, visit mikebickle.org. Join us again next week on Passion for Jesus. Because of gifts from people like you, we are able to produce and distribute resources to help prayer ministries and individuals around the globe experience enjoyable prayer and grow in intimacy with Jesus. I encourage you to join us financially as we proclaim the beauty of Jesus until His glorious return. Go to ihopkc.org give to give online and find out more.